From wherever or whenever you join us, welcome to this collaborative worship of the Baha Four. We are four Unitarian Universalist congregations of Southeast Arizona, one in Amado, one in Sierra Vista, and two in Tucson. We gather because we know we are stronger together. We believe that it is important every time we begin worship to acknowledge that the land we live and meet on is stolen. This is ancestral or tribal land of the Pascoyaki, the Chiricahua Apache, the Otham and Apata, and they live here still. We acknowledge that we, alongside our indigenous neighbors, have a responsibility to be in right relationship with each other and the land. We know that this land has been subject to a complicated history of colonization that we are a part of and affects us still. We need to work on our acknowledgement and on writing our relationships with the indigenous peoples who live here. We take seriously the words of Dr. Cornell West, to try again, fail again, fail better. Right now, we of the Baja Four are taking part in a worship arc that calls us to grow to keep trying at difficult conversations as we consider subjects that are taboo, so hard to have that we avoid them and even wall them off from our communities. Today, we will explore authority and why it can be hard to claim and the fake fights that can crop up in congregations if we ignore it. These words by the Reverend Angela Herrera call us into difficulty and messiness. And they remind us that all our parts, even the awkward ones, may be needed here. As I light this chalice, will you light one or a candle, whatever you have at hand, along with me? Invocation by Reverend Angela Herrera. Don't leave your heart at the door. Bring it to the altar of life. Don't leave your anger behind. It has high standards and the world has need of vision. Bring them with you and your joy and your passion. Bring your loving and your courage and your conviction. Bring your need for healing and your power to heal. There is work to do and you have all you need to do it right here in this room. Freedom that reveres the past, the drum. 
Hi, friends. The story we have for you today is out of the Jewish tradition. It's told to us by Yossi Gordon, but it comes to them from Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. Now, originally, this story is called The Turkey Prince, but the recruit that we had to be the turkey prince didn't want to be called a turkey. He also didn't want to be called a chicken. And so we've named him the rooster prince. Here's the story. There was once a prince who lived with his royal grown-ups in splendid fashion. He received the finest education and upbringing. To his grown-ups' chagrin, however, one day the prince went through an identity crisis, came to the conclusion that he was really a rooster and not a human being. Initially, the, the royals thought he was kidding. However, after he stopped joining them at the royal table and instead moved under the table and sat there naked and pecking at crumbs, they knew that serious trouble was afoot. Needless to say, the prince's strange behavior caused incredible angst for his loving grown-ups and intense embarrassment for the whole royal family. The one adult was ready to spare no expense for the person who could cure their son. The finest doctors and psychiatrists of the land came to consult one after another after another. They tried to cure the prince with no success. The royals were at a loss until a gentle-looking wise woman came to the palace. I hereby offer to cure the prince free of charge, declared the woman. My only condition is that no one interferes with anything I do. Intrigued and a little bit desperate, the royals agreed. The following day, the prince had company under the table. It was the wise woman. What are you doing here? asked the rooster prince. Why are you here? countered the wise woman. I am a rooster, responded the prince emphatically. Well, I am also a rooster, the woman replied. With that, she began to crow like a rooster and peck at crumbs on the floor. The prince was convinced. And a few days passed this way between the two of them. One morning, the wise woman asked the royal dresser to bring them a shirt. She said to the prince, you know, I do not see any reason a rooster can't wear a shirt. The prince thought about it and then agreed. Soon the two of them were wearing shirts. A couple more days passed and the wise woman asked the royal dressers, maybe bring us a pair of pants. And she says to the rooster prince, it is not forbidden for roosters to wear pants, is it? Certainly not. And the prince once again thought it over and agreed. Soon the two of them were wearing pants. And so the process continued. Shortly thereafter, the wise woman convinced the rooster prince that it wasn't forbidden for roosters to eat human food or to sit at the table or to engage with the family in human talk. And within a short time, the rooster prince, although still maintaining that he was a rooster, began conducting himself exactly like the person he was before. So what do we make of this story? I really like the fact that the wise woman, when she finally got the prince up at the table, it wasn't through force or, co or coercion. It wasn't because she threatened him or they stopped loving him. In fact, it was just the opposite. They loved him more, even though he said, I'm a rooster. How would that be in our congregations if we said, it's okay for you to be a rooster and it's okay for me to be a royal and we can sit at the table together. The false fight is that we all have to be the same in order to be at the table together. Building bridges between our divisions I reach out to you, will you reach out to me? With all of our voices and all of our visions, friends, we could make such sweet harmony. Building bridges between our divisions, 
I reach out to you, will you reach out to me? With all of our voices and all of our visions, friends, we could make such sweet harmony. Building bridges between our divisions, I reach out to you. A Call to Arms by Rev. Marta Valentin Spirit of truth and justice, hear us as we ask that you hold the collective anxiety that permeates this fear-field situation. This is a call to arms. Arms that will hold broken hearts and elated hearts. Arms that wrap themselves around a body beaten and disfigured in truth and metaphorically. Arms that provide a strength neither giver nor receiver knew they possessed. Arms that hold up the sky of misplaced authority and righteousness from crashing down upon the heads struggling to be held high as each shred of dignity is yanked from their tired, overused, underappreciated bodies. This is a call for committed arms to continue leading heads and hearts to know the facts but feel the truth. A call to remember that the freedom we've been given to swing our arms as wide and open to the sun as we like has come on the backs of humans others wish were invisible. This is a call to arm ourselves with the facts but feel the truth. Born out of the power of our Unitarian Universalist love and the balance of justice. like sunshine goes everywhere its temple of space its shrine the good heart its creed all true its ritual works of love If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. Now we may be used to hearing the rest of this passage from the first letter to the Corinthians in weddings or in other romantic settings, but the Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd sets it straight. That's a letter from an overextended pastor with occasionally dubious judgment to a congregation whose leaders are in a constant state of fierce and unremitting conflict, she tells us. The early Christians in the Corinth congregation were literally shouting their prayers like clanging cymbals over top one another to try and prove who was better at praying. They were making faith into a contest. Hmm. 
There are some days, some days when that description is more familiar to us than the relationships of love named in that letter to the church in Corinth. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Biblical scholar and Methodist minister, the Reverend Walter Wink, through his faith, believes that this passage and many others are about the angels of a church. Rather than supernatural beings, an angel is the church's wholeness. It's more than its sum of the parts, completeness. And he believes that even today, when we ignore the angels of our churches, we do so at our own peril. If we give attention and energy and focus to the fake fights and ignore our relationships, our angels become demonic, dividing us as a people and reducing us as individuals, ending what good we can accomplish together. And yet, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we only know in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three and the greatest of these are our relationships in love. We have a guest speaker this morning, <laughs> but really I'm here to talk with you about the taboo of authority. In Unitarian Universalist congregations, authority is a taboo topic. And we have a lot of fake fights about authority. And we laugh about many of the fake fights I'm about to name um, because we find the humor in them and we also see the realness in them, right? Those fake fights in congregations about, oh, say, what color to paint the bathroom. Gosh, those can be big arguments. Or the arguments around what committees do and don't do, what they have the authority to do and not do. We have fights about what to keep and what not to keep and who gets to make that decision. Actually, any time someone in some conversation asks, who gets to make the decision? Who gets to decide? I think any time that question is asked, we are having a fake fight, small or large, about authority. And what's actually under that, the real talk of this taboo and these fake fights, is trust. It's who we trust, how we trust our leaders, how our leaders, how, how we as leaders are trusted, um, how communities learn to trust not just the people in leadership, but the roles, the minister the board, the religious educator, the committee leaders. How do we trust these roles, no matter who is in them? How do we rebuild trust when trust has been broken by someone in a particular role or by a particular person? Some of you know that um, one of the primary reasons I came to UUCT was to help rebuild trust. There was a lot of broken trust in the years before I arrived, and I came knowing that there was trust to rebuild. And I wanted to support this culture, not only of rebuilding, but of rebuilding and collaborating, understanding how to do shared ministry, shared work. And actually, I see the Baja Four collaboration as an extension of these intentions. 
It was clear to me when I arrived at the congregation where I had uh, very clear authority and where I needed to build some trust in order to have some authority. Now, in a Christian context, in a Christian church, I might have come in and been able to say, we must align our budgets with the vision, our vision of the kingdom of God. We must, right? That's where my authority might have come from and in Christian congregations. But in Unitarian Universalist congregations, my authority comes from relationships with people. My trust comes from the relationships I build from my observation and participation of committees and my relationships with leaders, from learning stories from the past and understanding, co-creating where we want to go together. That's where my authority as a minister in a Unitarian Universalist congregation comes from. And in Unitarian Universalist spaces, our authority is shaped by our own unique gifts. There's not this one model of a leader modeled after the um, heterosexual patriarchal God of a Christian, of a Christian Christianity or, um, or other religious traditions. We actually create space to let the metaphorical or maybe literal chicken lead from their strengths. They don't have to be human in order to be a leader. Maybe they do, but they don't have to be the, uh, the stereotypical version of a leader in order to lend their gifts in our congregations. And I share this to say that in Unitarian Universalist congregations, authority does not come from above. It comes from our sides, from our relationships and the unique gifts that we bring within and then the covenants that live amongst us. And when these covenants, these relationships are strained, when trust amongst us is broken, that's when we start to mistrust authority. I want to share a story from a, another Unitarian Universalist congregation that I know well. And this is a story that's about 15, maybe even 20 years old. And they were making a decision about what to do with one, their minister. Just about half the congregation really loved the minister. And just about half the congregation really did not like the minister. And they were having conversation for a long time about what to do, whether or not to fire this minister. And it was someone's idea in the context of this swirl of this conversation um, to have people in the meeting that they were having in their sanctuary get up and go to one side of the room if they wanted to keep the minister and go to the other side of the room if they wanted to fire the minister. And you can imagine how this felt to both put your body in a space and then also see your friends, your congregation, these people you loved and trusted on the other side of this space. Needless to say, this exercise uh, really hurt the trust that the congregation had in their leaders and that they had in one another. It was hard for them to see themselves literally split in half. And after this happened, the minister ended up deciding to leave by their own volition. Um, and after this happened, the congregation was started fighting with one another, continued to fight with one another. And the leadership made a very intentional choice then to say, we have to rebuild trust. And they said, we're not just on a one year journey here. This is not a one year project. We are gonna hire a minister to help us rebuild trust. And they did, they actually hired two different ministers who were there for a total of 10, 11 years who helped them over that decade of time rebuild trust in one another, in their leaders and in each other. Now, not everybody stayed for the trust building process, but those who did stay, they rebuilt enough trust that they told me they actually forgot which friends of theirs were on the other side of the room when they had had that really harmful uh, decision-making process. 
They felt like they were one congregation again, like they trusted one another and that trust wouldn't be broken again. And they trusted that their leaders could guide them well and their leaders wouldn't ask them to divide themselves again. They ended up rededicating their sanctuary, that space where that decision had been made, and they'd rededicated it to their community, to one another, and the trust they had built. And I share this story because the real talk of authority, trust, can be broken and it can be rebuilt. Now, as I mentioned, uh, when I came to the UU Church of Tucson, there was a lot of areas where trust needed to be rebuilt. There was some good rebuilding that had already happened when I arrived. And there were some areas where I, in particular, as my role as a new minister coming in, needed to build some significant trust with leaders and committees and staff. And I won't share all the ways that we managed to build some good trust with one another um, that strengthened my authority, that strengthened my power in healthy ways. But I wanna share just one small story to illustrate how trust can be built in maybe creative ways. So my office at UUCT is just off the main office where you go and see our administrator, Mary Weiss, um, and you bring your pledge and you drop off mail and you go and ask about calendaring things. It's just like any other church office. And my office is just visible from the main door to the church office. And my first year there, um, my desk was kind of out of view of that doorway into my office. So even if the door was open, you couldn't really see if I was there or not. And it was really interesting. People would come in and I would hear three, four, or five times a day, oh, is Reverend Bethany in? I would hear that coming out of the church office. And I would go, if I wasn't in the middle of something, I would go and see what was there, talk to the person, answer their questions, or meet and greet them. Um, and then I realized that really the question came up a lot. People couldn't tell I was there, even though the door to my office was open. So my second year, I moved the desk so you could actually see it from the front office right when you walk in. So no longer did you have to ask if I was there. You could just look and see, oh, she's at her desk, she's working. Oh, look through the window and see that she's in a meeting um, or what have you. And if the door was closed or if I wasn't at my desk, then I wasn't there for some reason. And this helped build trust, the trust, specific trust, that the minister at UUCT is present and here, available to us when we need her or when we need them. Authority, as I said, is rooted in trust. And trust is the foundation of any healthy relationship. And healthy power comes from healthy authority not the other way around. We don't get authority because we have power. We get healthy power because we have healthy authority. And when we use our power wisely in whatever authoritative role we hold, when we use our power wisely and in relationship with others, when we follow through on our responsibilities, our power can grow. And then we come to another important piece of this authority, uh, trust, power puzzle, which is recognition. This is not something we do as frequently as we need to in many congregations and communities. It's important that we recognize our leaders, those people we ask to take on authority and to have power on our behalf. My first year at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Tucson, I introduced a, a new tradition. It's a spin on flower communion, where rather than each taking one flower, we gave out many flowers of many different colors, recognizing those leaders in our congregation, the people who had led committees, who had uh, helped with the stewardship drive, who had been on staff, who had helped with worship, who had sung in the choir, et cetera, et cetera, that year. And so people would go home with many different color flowers, designating the gifts that they had offered to our community. 
And the first year, folks just raved about the ritual. They loved the idea of recreating this new ritual, and they loved that they were recognized for the small and big things that they did for our community, for the power and authority they had taken in different ways. And we actually broke some trust through the ritual that year. We forgot some significant groups within our congregation. We didn't name them explicitly, and they weren't on the slides at the front of the sanctuary. So the second year, we actually did the ritual just the Sunday before the pandemic really started in earnest. We went online. The second year, we included those people. We left fewer people out. We didn't make the same mistake again. We tried to recognize more of our leaders. And this was an important ritual and one I think will continue when we're back because it was a yearly reminder that we need to acknowledge, recognize those who have led our congregation, everybody from the people who've served on the board to the ushers, to the people who have brought food for social hour one week. This series on taboos is about pulling back the veil, not about fixing or solving a thing. So rather than fixing or solving, I wanna leave you with some questions for reflection. Where in your congregation or in your life have you fully trusted another's authority? And what helped build that trust in you? Where in your congregation or life have you held authority? Was that authority recognized, appreciated, and how? And finally, what is the relationship between authority and power? What is the relationship between trust and power?
A New Song, A New Harmony by Rev. Dr. Richard S. Gilbert By our presence here with one another, hearing the harmony that is the music of the spheres, may some of the harshness and discord of our human lives be transmuted into music. A new song in our hearts may there be, and a new harmony in our beings, so that we shall return to our several duties with fresh courage and with eagerness and with rejoicing. Amen. You want to preach a sermon today? You want to preach a sermon? You want to tell us what you think about authority? You think authority should scratch your face? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes.